Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Stephen Dobson and Johanna Ohm. Dr. Dobson's a professor at the University of Kentucky and a member of the Department of Entomology. He's a medical entomologist by training who has been investigating cytoplasmic incompatibility in mosquitoes and the intracellular bacteria Wolbachia that is responsible for it in some insects. In 2010, he decided to put theory into practice and founded Mosquito Mate Incorporated, a company leading the way on developing and implementing the incompatible insect technique an instant insect control method that is based on cytoplasmic incompatibility. Dr. Ohm is a scientist at Verily Life Sciences. Verily Life Sciences is a life science research organization within, the, within Alphabet Inc. She's working on their debug project where they, as they say, and I'll quote, are trying to stop bad mosquitoes by raising and releasing good ones. Dr. Ohm is the technical lead for Debug's mosquito production systems, and it's primarily focused on developing Debug's next generation mosquito larval rearing systems. The work at Verily is very interesting. We're going to really enjoy hearing about it. With that, let me say uh, welcome, Stephen and Joe. Hello. Good. Thanks for your willingness to uh, participate today. Really happy to have you. And I'm really excited uh, about hearing about the work and the work that you're collaborating with, uh, with Verily on. So Stephen, let me invite you to share your presentation at this time. Uh, let me know when you've uh, got it up and I'll, I'll let you know whether or not you've been successful. Okay, am I successful? Yep. You've been successful and I can hear you. Uh, your visual is good and the audio is good and the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Super. Well, thanks again, uh, Dave and Hector, as well as the FNIH for the invitation and the opportunity to present today. Um, I, I guess I first want to start with just acknowledging the, the many uh, collaborators, uh, uh, funding agencies without which uh, this work would not be possible. Uh, my name is Stephen Dobson, as you've just heard, I'm a professor of entomology at the University of Kentucky, and I'm also the CEO of this uh, university spinoff named Mosquito Mate. Now, Dr. Ohm and I have the benefit of uh, building on the uh, previous uh, presentations in the series. So uh, in listening to the prior lectures on irradiated and genetically modified mosquitoes, you already know that these, these technologies are all built on the, the ability of a male mosquito uh, and the fact that males don't bite. Uh, they don't transmit pathogens that cause human disease. And importantly, they are highly evolved and adapted to seek out uh, and mate with female mosquitoes, which makes them the perfect delivery mechanism. Uh, you've also heard from previous lectures that uh, historically, these approaches that are uh, in which uh, male mosquitoes are being released, historically they're, they're based on uh, irradiation, uh, irradiation of those males. And there's a number of uh, very successful agricultural examples, uh, which we've heard about in previous lectures, um, so including the screwworm, the uh, pink bollworm. Um, uh, some of these have been successful on a continental scale. Um, they require these large rearing facilities uh, uh, and then the release of these irradiated uh, insects. And again, highly successful. You've also heard uh, in the previous lecture about the application of this uh, irradiation technology to mosquitoes and that historically uh, there, uh, there have been some complications and specifically that the uh, dose of radiation that's required to fully sterilize uh, some species of these male mosquitoes can also make them sick. And that's kind of illustrated by this uh, cartoon here. Um, as you can imagine on this continuum, uh, going to higher doses of radiation as you move to the right, at some point you actually irradiate the, irradiate the males to where they're, they're dead. Uh, and, and, and then we can turn down the dose to where they're, they're fully fit. And importantly, we need these males to be fully fit because they have to get out there and compete 
against wild type males that have not been irradiated or, or genetically modified or infected with Wolbachia and, and all these technologies. And so what uh, you heard about last week from Dr. Boyer is um, uh, some exciting new uh, developments uh, where they're testing a lot of new um, methods. Um, for example, switching from irradiating pupa to now uh, trying irradiation of adult males. Also things like hypoxia, uh, irradiating under very low dose oxygen levels. Um, um, so some, some interesting new methods to, to basically what we're aiming for is right here by this, with this red arrow, a male that's sterile, but, but fully fit and able to get out there and compete as opposed to one that uh, may be fully sterile, but is not fully competitive. So what we've done and what you're gonna hear uh, Dr. Ohm and I talk about over the next few minutes is instead of uh, um, also trying to improve upon radiation technologies, we uh, here we've actually moved completely away from irradiation as the sterilant. We're not using genetic modification. Here we're focusing on Wolbachia. So this is, uh, here you can see in green is Wolbachia pipientis. Uh, it is an obligate intracellular bacterium. So here you can see it inside the insect cells, the insect's nuclei are in blue. The green is the Wolbachia floating around in the cytoplasm of this insect. And it's a maternally inherited bacterium. So here you can see Wolbachia, this cloud of uh, uh, Wolbachia in the pole of the embryo. It's being passed from mothers to both sons and daughters. So that's gonna play a role uh, later on. So keep in mind that Wolbachia is maternally inherited. Males are a dead end for Wolbachia infection. And as highlighted over here in this uh, uh, um, periodical, the uh, Wolbachia is, is known to occur, in, or at least estimated to occur in over half of all insects. It's a very successful um, bacterium. It's found in bees and butterflies and beetles. And in this uh, uh, high school uh, experiment, uh, basically you can send your students out no matter where you are in the world and collect a random assortment of insects and uh, bring them in and do some uh, PCR or molecular testing and roughly half of them should be infected with Wolbachia. So it's a, a tremendous evolutionary success. And part of the reason for that is its ability to manipulate the reproduction of its host. And what we'll be talking about today is called cytoplasmic incompatibility. And um, you've, you've heard about uh, Wolbachia a couple of lectures ago, and I'm gonna spend a few slides just uh, contrasting. Uh, what we're gonna be talking about today is very different from uh, what Dr. Moriera talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, yes, we're, we're doing this in some of the same species of Wolbachia, uh, same species of mosquitoes, some of the same species of Wolbachia, uh, but it's a very different approach. And I'll try to highlight that over the next few slides. So uh, in general, the, the overall application is very similar to what you've been hearing about in, in past uh, lectures in this symposia. It is the repeated inundated release of these male mosquitoes. So that's what's illustrated by this wavy line, it's pulses of males going into the population, you've got time on the x-axis. Uh, and then uh, this is an indicator of population size on the y. Uh, here's the wild type population. As the, the same level of male releases take place, an increasing proportion of the population becomes sterilized or made incompatible, the eggs don't hatch. And, uh, and here's what happens. So this is the, the Wolbachia infected male that's being released. Um, when, when the wild type mates with wild type, you get wild type offspring, as you would expect. But in this example, where the Wolbachia infected male mates with the wild type female, you get this incompatibility. And the result in, in these mosquitoes is that the chromosomes don't segregate uh, correctly. You get, in, uh, instead of the, the, the chromosomes lining up across the metaphase plate and dividing normally, you get this heterochromatic clump of, uh, of DNA uh, and, and the paternal chromosomes never segregate. And so therefore uh, the mosquito can't survive uh, as a haploid and uh, it leads to early developmental arrest and the eggs don't hatch. Now, um, CI or cytoplasmic incompatibility takes a lot of different forms. We could spend the whole 25 minutes 
Uh, talking about examples again in butterflies and bees, there are many different variations. But for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to focus on uh, a couple of examples. This is an example that we call unidirectional incompatibility. And uh, this happens where uh, one of the uh, types, uh, let's say this is a mosquito type, is infected, shown by green. One is uninfected, shown in white. And in this example, um, well, and in all the examples that I'm going to show today, the same rule applies. And that is that if the male has a Wolbachia infection that's different from his mate, then it's an incompatible cross. So in this example, Here's the male that has the green Wolbachia infection. He's mating with a female who's uninfected. The white means uninfected. And so it's a different infection type. And so therefore it's an incompatible cross. The eggs don't hatch. In all the other crossing uh, variations, you do get egg hatch and the Wolbachia type is inherited from mom. And so therefore these all carry the infection. And so as you can see, the, in this scenario, the Wolbachia has an advantage relative to the uninfected females. And this is what leads to the spread of Wolbachia into the population, which I'll show in just a moment. So a second example, um, uh, and I could say that the previous example, uh, one, one would be Aedes aegypti. Aedes aegypti mosquitoes are not normally infected, not naturally infected with Wolbachia. And so uh, when you hear us talk about uh, Egypti and Dr. Ohm's presentation later, that's what's going on there. This example might be Aedes albopictus, which is naturally infected. And here, what you can see, instead of having uninfected individuals, we have two different types of Wolbachia, a red type and a green type, if you will. And in this case, the same rule applies. If the male has an infection type that's different from his mate, it's an incompatible cross. And so that's true in this case, where the green male mates with the red female, and the reciprocal cross. It's only when both the male and female have the same Wolbachia type that it's a compatible cross uh, and the eggs hatch. And again, they're inheriting the Wolbachia from, from their mother. So just to quickly review the, uh, these two contrasting strategies, a couple of weeks ago from Dr. Moriera, you heard about this population replacement approach. Both of these are based on Wolbachia. Both of these are focused on uh, 80s, at least include Aedes aegypti. Uh, and so uh, this is the Eliminate Dengue, now known as the World Mosquito Program, taking place in Brazil. Importantly, um, so with the population replacement, you heard a couple of weeks ago, their intent is, is not to necessarily reduce the population size. They're not using it as a pesticide, but instead they're establishing the Wolbachia type in the field. That's the goal. Uh, so with success, you don't have fewer Egypti, they're just now they're infected with this Wolbachia type. And the, the rationale for that is the thinking is that the uh, mosquitoes that carry the Wolbachia uh, may, may live a shorter period of time. They, they may be less able to transmit the, the dengue virus, for example. So that's population replacement. Importantly, because um, Wolbachia is only inherited through the female, it's maternally inherited, this approach necessarily requires that you release females. You have to release females for, for it to succeed. Oops, sorry. Well, back is suppression, which is what we're focused on today. And again, contrasting the two is focused on the release of males. And here the goal is not to replace the population, but to reduce the, the population size. So very much like a, an insecticide or a pesticide. And we'll be talking about examples today for both Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti. So just to show that in another example, this is a model, uh, kind of maybe a segue to, to the next series on modeling, but this is showing a population replacement approach, such as some of the uh, uh, CRISPR or gene drive type systems or uh, the Wolbachia system that we heard about a couple of weeks ago from Dr. Moriera, where uh, the Wolbachia population replacement. So this is an island, if you will, a simulated island. Uh, this number here is an indicator of time. Uh, and then the, the y-axis, if you will, is the number of females. And so uh, what you're seeing is the start, and I'll restart this once it completes. At the start, this island is uniformly uh, uh, a single Wolbachia type, uh, and there's, and then at time point zero, there's a seeding of the population, a single introduction of these Wolbachia infected females, 
And then what you're seeing is because you release the Wolbachia infected females because of this incompatibility and the advantage that it provides to the infected cytotype, you're seeing the green type becoming replaced with the Wolbachia infected red type. Um, and so, yes, and there, there's examples. We've heard about this a couple of weeks ago uh, taking place in uh, Australia and Brazil. So then just to, to contrast this with the Wolbachia suppression approach, here, same island, uh, indicator of time, uh, you start with this green uh, population. Here we're releasing these Wolbachia infected males in the center of this island. And note there's no, this red area, it's not increasing like it did in the last uh, illustration. And that's because we're only releasing males and Wolbachia is not transmitted through males. And so we're just causing this incompatibility. We're pushing the population down just like you would with the radiation. Uh, uh, and there's no corresponding increase of the, the uh, introduced Wolbachia type because Wolbachia is not passed through, through uh, males. Uh, and so with success, uh, by eliminating the mosquitoes from the center of this island, you could then reallocate those males, move out to the periphery of the island and eliminate the population. So that's the approach that uh, Dave introduced with, uh, say, Dr. Lavin uh, back in the 60s. So with the modeling data, we then moved into doing uh, laboratory cage studies as well as uh, large greenhouse trials. This is uh, some results. Um, and let me just kind of explain what you're looking at here. You've got time on the x-axis, this is in weeks. The y-axis again is a, a number of females, indicator of uh, population size. And we have two parallel uh, greenhouses, two replicate greenhouses. One is in red and the other is in black. And, uh, and, and then you've got these gray boxes, and this indicates the release of Wolbachia infected males. So uh, the, these Wolbachia infected males are only being released during this period shown by these gray, bo gray boxes. And so what you can see in the absence of uh, releases, these two replicate cages are tracking each other fairly well. Uh, but then in this second experiment where we release the Wolbachia infected males only into the red greenhouse, if you will. Uh, what you can see is the red line going down uh, and being eliminated within about um, uh, eight, eight weeks. Here's another repeat with the same outcome. Again, the, the black uh, cage, the control cage that's not receiving the Wolbachia infected males uh, remains stable uh, and persists. So we took this data to the EPA uh, and requested a permit to conduct field trials. And this took place in around 2012. We started talking with the Biopesticides and Pollution Prevention Division. Um, this is what it looked like at the time. Uh, we've subsequently been uh, uh, adopted by a new branch of the EPA, uh, Novel Technologies Branch. But uh, this is how we started. And uh, after about a year or two of working with them, we received uh, experimental use permits uh, initially for Aedes albopictus and then subsequently for Aedes aegypti. And so this is the WV1 strain, uh, which you'll also hear about in Dr. Ohm's talk. talk. And then this is the ZAP strain of albopictus. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, Dr. Ohm is gonna give us, uh, she's gonna do a deep dive into what some of these trials look like. I'm just gonna do a very quick overview. Uh, as you can imagine in the initial work, we. Uh, focused a lot on uh, logistics, uh, some very applied problem solving. So we're based in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, that's where we're doing the rearing of these mosquitoes. And yet some of our field uh, work was, was taking place in, uh, out of state. For example, in, in California, this is a work that was done with Consolidated Mosquito Abatement District in Fresno or Clovis. And so we had to develop approaches to package, uh, well, to rear, se separate, remove the females, and then package these males in such a way that they could be shipped uh, and released in, in California. And remember, this is what I talked about earlier, this, the importance of these males being competitive. And so is it possible that all this handling and shipping and who knows what the temperature is as they're going, that maybe by the time they get to California, maybe they're less competitive. And so here's a uh, picture of them being released in the field. And so we spent a lot of time uh, examining the, the shipped males on the receiving end, uh, looking at things like this uh, cage assay, this should look familiar from last week, looking at male competitiveness, 
So here we're varying the ratio of incompatible males. Uh, again, this is on the California side after shipment, uh, going from 0% incompatible males to 100% uh, incompatible males. Uh, and, then, and then measuring the egg hatch here on the Y axis. This line is what one would expect if they are equally competitive. Uh, this is just a quick summary showing uh, lab cages as well as some of these larger greenhouse or mesocosm cages. And, and in short, we were able to determine that the males actually survived uh, shipment very well uh, uh, become, and remained competitive on the far end. We also were looking at things that are very specific questions of the regulators. So for example, uh, female contamination rates. How often is it that a female happens to be in one of these uh, male release tubes? Uh, looking at things like, uh, could Wolbachia become unintentionally established at the release site? So remember uh, with Dr. Moriera's uh, talk a few weeks ago, that's the, the goal. They want to uh, establish Wolbachia at the uh, release site. But in contrast, we, uh, we're releasing only males. Males are dead end hosts for Wolbachia, and so therefore uh, the Wolbachia should not become established. But doing PCR reactions, we can screen to, to look for that and actually confirm it. And then obviously um, looking at things like um, given a known uh, release rate, if we do PCR assays on the collected males, what proportion of them are uh, the Wolbachia release males? And so we can establish a, a, a release ratio from that. So moving forward very quickly, because I'm conscious of the time, um, this is what a typical trial looked like. Um, so you can see we've moved from California. This is now uh, Stock Island, Florida, which is in Monroe County. It's down in the Florida Keys. Um, you'll see a recurring theme throughout uh, my presentation, but also in, in uh, Dr. Ohm's talk in a few minutes. Uh, there's a, so, uh, one or more treated sites, one or more untreated sites. We like to keep a, uh, a distance between them of at least a kilometer just to minimize uh, any you know, released males migrating across and affecting the untreated site. Uh, we're doing things like measuring the adult number uh, using uh, biogens or BG traps. Uh, also collecting eggs with ova traps, looking at both egg number, uh, density of the population, but also uh, egg hatch rates. Because of this incompatibility, and because we're releasing millions of these males, we anticipate the hatch rate is gonna go down. Uh, we love working on islands because that gets, uh, gets away from some of these uh, um, uh, immigration effects that you see where uh, females from outside the release area are immigrating into the, the release area and laying eggs that hatch. So it's always a complication. But also doing things like going into, here's an example of uh, uh, Miami, where uh, it's not an island. Uh, and in the release and treatment area, there's a plenty of infestation and plenty of opportunity for, for immigration. Again, you're going to hear a lot more about this in, in Dr. Ohm's presentation. But, but generally, the, the idea is we like to pick two sites that are uh, very similar demographics. Uh, we like to, if possible, have substantial monitoring data prior to starting the male releases just to confirm that they're similar. And again, you'll hear more details about this in Dr. Ohm's talk. So just to wrap things up, a very quick synopsis. This is where we have uh, done trials to date. The uh, pink color is for the Aedes aegypti. It shows both the city uh, where the releases took place as well as the years. The yellow is the 80s Albopictus work. Uh, and then down here, this Gantt at the bottom is showing you for Albopictus that we progressed from lab studies all the way through EUP permitted uh, field trials to where we now have full registration for the ZAP mosquitoes. Uh, 80s aegypti started behind uh, ZAP a little bit later. Uh, we have conducted those field trials that data is currently under review at the EPA, and we are hopeful to receive a decision from them in 2021, uh, this year. Uh, and just to highlight, uh, I'm sure Dr. Ohm is gonna do this as well. Um, you can see that uh, a lot of this work has been published. If, if anybody is interested, if you don't have access, uh, please contact me, and I'm happy to provide additional information. And the one last thing I wanna do before I turn things over to last slide, before I turn it over to Dr. Ohm, is um, to emphasize that while today we're focused on um, uh, 80, 80 species, Egypti specifically and Albopictus as well, um, just as Dave mentioned in his introduction, 
this technology has the potential to be extended to other mosquito species. Uh, Anopheles, which are uh, important to transmitting um, malaria as well as other pathogens. And here's an example where the target's not so much human disease, but uh, a bird pathogen. Um, in Hawaii, the, the um, invasive Culex are transmitting uh, avian malaria between birds and putting some endangered species at higher risk of extinction. And so uh, happy to provide this additional information if, if someone's interested. So with that, I should uh, stop. I think I'm over my time and I will yield the floor to Dr. Ohm. Hi, thanks Stephen for that great overview of how we can use Wolbachia infected males to uh, effectively suppress wild populations of mosquitoes that transmit disease. Let me just pull up my slides here. So the DBUG project partners with Mosquito Mate and government agencies to try to make this Wolbachia-based mosquito control approach scalable with the hope that if we can make uh, Wolbachia-based uh, mosquito control really widely available, we could have a big impact on uh, the diseases that these types of mosquitoes transmit. So as David mentioned earlier, Debug is a project that's based at Verily Life Sciences. And we develop tools, uh, including hardware and software tools to really make this process of producing massive numbers of Wolbachia infected male mosquitoes um, more efficient. As Stephen really thoroughly went over, uh, Wolbachia is a bacteria that naturally occurs in most insect species. And we use a transinfected line of Aedes aegypti that has a Wolbachia infection, which when released into wild populations has this phenotype called cytoplasmic incompatibility, which means that our released Wolbachia infected males are incompatible with the wild females that are not infected. So as uh, Stephen also showed in his uh, little video, what happens is over time with enough uh, introduction of our Wolbachia infected males, those matings are incompatible, the eggs are unable to hatch, and over time we can really rapidly drop the population of wild mosquitoes. For this technology to be effective, we need to have consistent uh, large numbers of Wolbachia infected males released into the wild so we can outcompete the wild males and uh, ensure that those wild females get mated with the Wolbachia infected males. Uh, the eggs won't hatch over time that population gets reduced. Uh, the one tricky part about producing a lot of Wolbachia infected males is that mosquitoes have a very complicated life cycle. I think most of you listening probably have some familiar, familiarity with rearing mosquitoes or maybe have even uh, produced mosquitoes in a large scale production facility. Some of the complicated aspects of their life cycle is that adult females require a blood meal in order to produce eggs. This means that we have to have a constant supply of fresh blood and uh, we also need to have a cold supply chain in order to uh, get that diet for the adult females. The other really interesting thing about rearing mosquitoes is that unlike a lot of insects that are uh, mass reared for sterile insect technique, mosquitoes have both an aquatic stage, uh, so all the juvenile forms develop in water, and the adult stage uh, is terrestrial. So when we want to mass produce mosquitoes in a factory, we have to accommodate both the aquatic juvenile stages and the terrestrial environment that the adults need. Uh, and also, as Stephen mentioned, when we use the Wolbachia uh, based approach, we need to really make sure that we only release male mosquitoes. Uh, female mosquitoes that are infected with Wolbachia are compatible with our Wolbachia infected males. And so if we want to make sure that we suppress the population, rather than replacing the population, we need to do everything we can to make sure that we only release males, avoid releasing females and cause suppression rather than replacement. The last thing that uh, makes mosquito rearing and releasing difficult is there's a limited dispersal ability of mosquitoes in the field. So mosquitoes can only fly so far 
if we want to suppress a wild population that is broadly distributed, we need to make sure that we distribute our Wobaki infected males really even, evenly across our release sites so that they have a fighting chance to go out, find those females, um, and effectively suppress the population. On debug, we work on a number of uh, different types of tools to try to make this process more efficient. Uh, I'll talk about three of our main tools today and uh, just give you a brief overview here before diving into what these tools look like. We've developed an automated larval rearing system, which uh, collects larva from uh, recently hatched eggs and then inputs those uh, earliest stages of mosquito larva. So we call that the L1 stage when they're freshly hatched, uh, very tiny larva, and it rears them through until they pupate. So we have an automated system that uh, requires very little uh, human attention to rear those mosquitoes um, all through their aquatic juvenile development. After pupation, we've developed a number of uh, different tools to sex sort the mosquitoes. So again, we wanna minimize the chance that we'd ever accidentally release a female with our males. So we have two types of uh, processes, one that mechanically separates pupa at the, um, at the pupal stage and separates males and females based on differences in body size. And then we also have an adult uh, sex separation machine uh, that I'll show you how it works based on an industrial vision system. Uh, finally, we've also developed tools to make releases more efficient. So we have uh, release now in a number of different types of environment, and we've developed customized tools and software to make these releases a bit easier uh, depending on the environment we're releasing in. So to start with our mosquito rearing system, uh, in this picture, you can see what really typical mosquito mass rearing looks like. There's lots of trays, uh, lots of shelves uh, filled with uh, larva and mosquito, um, and mosquito water and food. We have a human here that has to go in and check on the larva, monitor their development, and maybe once or twice daily uh, deliver food to these larva. What we thought here at Debug might make this process a little bit easier is if we could remove the human needed in this process. So we've developed an automated larval rearing system, which, uh, which also looks very similar to the manual setup. So we have lots of trays filled with water and lots of larva. Uh, and unlike the uh, typical picture of manual mass rearing, we keep these trays of larva inside a enclosed container that uh, regulates the temperature really tightly. So the difference uh, between any of our shelves in our automated larval rearing system is within half a degree Fahrenheit. So really, really tight uh, temperature regulation that took a lot of engineering to create. And that means that we can have a really tight development window on uh, how long these mosquitoes take to, to develop. The other thing that's really nice about this system is that we've saved a ton of manual labor. I'll zoom in and show you what this system looks like. So on the first day of larval rearing, we uh, use a laser counter to precisely count mosquito larva after they've hatched. So these tiny L1 larva get passed through our laser counter, precisely counted into a dose of larva that we then put in these plastic bags. Uh, so the plastic bags you can see on the left are uh, actually the same exact material that's typically used for uh, packaging hot dogs or other type of uh, foods. And we add a uh, precisely a measured amount of water that's also um, auto automated um, in its ad. And then we also add a uh, exact amount of food. So once those bags of food, water and larva get packaged, they get passed by our storage and retrieval robot into the interior of our larval rearing system. Uh, so the larval rearing system has a robot that runs down the center aisle and can uh, store and retrieve these bags of larva in, uh, on index shelves that make it really easy for then uh, each day of the rearing cycle, the software allows us to schedule uh, what time we want these uh, mosquitoes to be fed and uh, without the need for a human to go in and manually do those feeds. The other thing that's really nice about this system is using uh, these plastic bags, 
means that um, day seven, when our development process uh, is ready to collect the pupa, the bags can get disposed. So we don't have to clean a bunch of trays. We save a lot of labor um, in terms of cleaning as well. Uh, so after uh, the mosquitoes have developed into the pupal stage, uh, this same robot will then pass uh, the mosquitoes to our sex sorting machines. So that's what our larval rearing system looks like. Uh, we first used this rearing system for our first field trial, which took place in Fresno, California uh, in 2017 and 2018. And that was our uh, first test of using this system. And we had a number of questions uh, as to whether we could use an automated larval rearing system to replace uh, manual rearing and still be able to produce consistent yields of male mosquitoes uh, that were of consistent quality. So again, the goal here was produce as many mosquitoes as possible and make them as uh, healthy and consistent in quality as uh, we can. So this is showing data from uh, 2018. So the insects that we produced for our Fresno uh, field trial. And what we measured here in the uh, data shown in the graph on the upper left-hand side of my screen is the average uh, adult number of, ma of males that we got out of our larval rearing system and passed through our uh, sex sorting process compared to the number of L1 larvae, so those early stage larvae that we input to the system. What you can see is uh, obviously there's a little bit of noise in the data. So most biological processes can be a little bit bouncy, but we were excited to see that the average here was about 70%. So um, of the 200 plus batches of mosquitoes that we reared over the course of 2018, uh, each one of those batches had anywhere from 50 of those uh, small plastic bags that I showed in the previous slide to several hundred. And uh, we consistently were able to get a majority of those larvae reared into pupa and then uh, released as adult males into the field. With that 70% average yield, we estimated that our automated larval rearing system could produce upwards of two and a half million uh, male pupa per week, which uh, we took as a big success for validating that automated larval rearing systems can uh, indeed replace the human labor of normal rearing processes to consistently produce uh, lots and lots of mosquitoes. The other thing that we do as a, as a check that our males are consistent in size, and we use this as a proxy for male quality, is measuring the length of our um, males as adults. So the idea is that um, consistent size and relatively large males tend to be healthier and if we uh, monitor their size, we can get an indicator of how consistent the, the rearing process is. So again, this is the same uh, mosquitoes that we used in the previous graph. This is data showing uh, every batch that we reared over the 2018 uh, field season and the sizes uh, in micrometers on the y-axis. Uh, one thing that I think is uh, really impressive about these data is uh, we had 14.4 million male mosquitoes released into the field during that 2018 field trial. And uh, the average of all of those uh, body lengths from millions and millions of mosquitoes uh, created a standard deviation of less than a millimeter in size. So uh, really consistent uh, sized mosquitoes demonstrating that this system could definitely be used for uh, consistent production of high yields and uh, consistent quality. So again, this data is from 2018. And since 2018, we've uh, made a number of changes to our larval rearing system. We're still experimenting with the optimal protocols uh, used in this system. But just to give you a taste of some of the things we've been working on more recently is we think we can make the automated larval rearing system more efficient with improved diets and possibly uh, different density protocols. So the other way that we estimate male quality uh, before releasing is by running longevity assays and evaluating how long do these males live uh, after we release them in the field. So on the right, you can see a graph of the days after we would have released males and on the y axis, the proportion of males in those longevity cages that are still alive. 
In 2018, we used a pretty standard uh, mosquito diet. So uh, commonly used is bovine liver powder. We used that same diet uh, throughout the 2018 uh, field trial and saw that our male longevity was about uh, four days after release. We've done a number of experiments trying out different diets and found that with um, changing the diet, we can actually extend that lifespan by about a day and a half, which is a, a huge gain for us because it means that the mosquitoes can hopefully live longer in the field, have more time to compete with wild males and uh, have more matings with the uh, wild females. Uh, the other thing that was exciting about uh, using an improved diet was that it seems like with a healthier diet, we could also uh, bump up the density in our larval rearing system. So in 2018, we used a relatively low density rearing protocol. Um, and what I'm showing in the upper left here is that the male longevity on that um, diet is increased with our new standard diet. So these mosquitoes are living close to six days on our um, improved diet protocols. But when we use that same diet and increase the density, we still get longer longevity than the low density protocols uh, that were fed with bovine liver powder. So really promising data that suggests we can uh, get the efficiency of the automated larval rearing system even higher if we um, change the densities that we're using and the diet that we're using. The next area of uh, technological development that we've been working on is the sex sorting process. So again, it's really important that for a Wolbachia-based suppression approach, we release only male mosquitoes rather than females. Um, accidental release of a female could result in establishment and population replacement. The most common way to sex separate uh, Aedes aegypti is through a machine called the Hox machine, which is shown in this picture. So uh, you can see that there's two uh, kind of clear bands of pupa in this picture. The female uh, pupa are bigger than male pupa. And so you can size separate with the Hox machine by having the larger female pupa get stuck in the um, wider section of the space between the two plates. And then smaller males fall through the narrower slot on the bottom. Uh, this machine works really great. It's very effective at separating male and female pupa. But one thing that Debug, um, again, wanted to see if we could uh, do is eliminate the need for a skilled human operator. So we uh, started developing a sex sorting process that eliminates the need for that uh, human operator. And it starts with an automated sieve to uh, similarly separate male and female pupa but uh, done by robot instead of by human. Uh, so on the left here, we have uh, the size dis distributions of male and female pupa. Uh, these measurements are taken at our South San Francisco rearing facility. You can see males tend to be smaller, females tend to be bigger, um, and we can design a sieve to separate the males and females the females, again, are bigger. So just like the Hawks machine, they get stuck behind and the males uh, pass through our sieve system. Uh, we, again, collected data on how efficiently we separated males from females throughout our 2018 field season in Fresno. So again, the x-axis here is the batch number from that 2018 field trial. And then on the y-axis, we uh, are reporting the fraction of male mosquitoes that um, are in our pupa samples on the other end of the sieve. So really encouragingly, the vast majority of female mosquitoes uh, don't pass through the sieve. So we have about 94% of the pupa after sieving are male, uh, which is great, uh, really pretty high efficiency, but that means that we still have a one in 40 chance that any one of those uh, pupa could be a female. So to further reduce the risk of potential female contamination, we then take these sieved pupa and pass them to the next stage of our sex separation process. So we do this at the adult stage. Uh, adult mosquitoes have really distinct morphological differences between the sexes. So we can use an industrial vision system to separate uh, male and females in the adult stage based on these characteristics. On the left-hand side, you can see a picture of what uh, adult Aedes aegypti female looks like. She has a very fine antenna 
and a relatively wide abdomen, which is uh, very different morphologically from what the males look like. On the right here, you can see a male mosquito. He has really bushy antenna. Uh, some people equate this to a mustache kind of look on their antenna. They also have claspers at the base of their abdomen and their, their abdomen's a lot narrower. So using these uh, distinguishing characteristics between males and females, our industrial vision software captures a picture of every single adult male that uh, we rear and that has gone through our pupa sieve. Um, as those males uh, pass under the industrial vision system, they get their picture taken. Uh, the picture then uh, gets evaluated as to whether that's a possible female um, contaminating our males or it labels it as a male. What this looks like in real time is we have our highly trained mosquitoes walking single file down these uh, sex sorting machine lanes. And we have a little trap door in the center of our lane that shuts behind each individual uh, mosquito. After the mosquito passes through the door, it gets its picture taken. Our industrial vision software then decides whether that um, image is of a male mosquito or a female mosquito. The males get accepted into our release containers and the females go into a reject path uh, that removes them from um, the process. So importantly, uh, this reduces our risk of female contamination by a number of order, orders of magnitude and really reduces the risk that we could potentially release a female. Uh, because we wanted to make sure that our industrial vision system couldn't also uh, be creating the risk of a female contaminant, we add another layer on top of that that uh, passes the images that our camera takes to a machine learning classifier. The machine learning algorithm then ranks all the photos that the industrial vision system takes and classifies them as how male-like or female-like those pictures that were originally labeled as male are. Any pictures that uh, machine learning catches as potentially female-like in the male labels then get passed to an, a team of expert reviewers to manually do a double check that those images are indeed of male mosquitoes and not female mosquitoes. So to give you an overview of what that uh, multi-step process um, in our sex sorting path looks like, again, it starts with pupa that are a mix of males and females. We pass them through our pupa sieve, which mechanically separates the larger females from the smaller males. That leaves us again with about a one in 40 chance that we have a female contaminant in our males. And then we do this multi-step process on the adults. So we start with our industrial vision, taking pictures of the mosquitoes, labeling them male or female, dependent on what those pictures look like. And that reduces uh, the chance of a female to about one in 40,000. When we add on top of that, our machine learning algorithm and the expert review step combined, we get a, a great risk reduction. So we estimate that if each step in this process is independent, um, at the end, we have less than a one in 840 million chance of ever contaminating our males with a female. Uh, so this is in comparison to um, just mechanical separation at the pupil stage, uh, one in 40 uh, compared to one in 840 million. So a big improvement from mechanical separation alone and uh, something we're really excited about in terms of um, reducing the risk of causing establishment. The final area that we've been working on uh, developing custom tools to release mosquitoes in our field sites is um, in release de devices. Again, our first field trial took place in Fresno, California, which looks like this video in the lower uh, left-hand side of my screen. You can see that the houses uh, are typically uh, low to the ground, like one or two story homes. The streets are really nice and wide. Uh, most mosquito habitat is really accessible by car. So for these types of sites, we developed a release van that releases mosquitoes out of a port on the side of the van. Uh, the drivers of these vans get um, software that maps all the release sites in our release areas that we want them to drive by. Uh, so as a driver of one of these release vans, you, you get to play uh, this 
fun game of Pac-Man where you're driving along the streets and as you uh, pass or collect one of our release site points, the van gets automatically triggered to release mosquitoes out of the port on the side of the van. And uh, the software collects data on um, where those were released when and the numbers of mosquitoes that uh, were released at each point. So that worked really well for our Fresno uh, field trials, but since Fresno, we've expanded into other areas that are really different in terms of uh, the cityscape and uh, landscape that we have to release into. On the right, you can see a picture of our Singapore uh, release site in Tampines. And you can see that the buildings are really different than a lot of the buildings in Fresno. So we have tall high-rise apartment buildings with lots of outdoor balconies that might have plants or tiny pots that mosquitoes uh, love to uh, breed in. So for sites like this, uh, we've developed alternative technologies. Instead of releasing on the ground, we're also uh, working on um, containers that can be used for manual releases, uh, spreading these mosquitoes to places where they might be hiding um, on upper level stories. So all of those tools and technologies we've developed to make production and releasing easier are only valuable if they can also effectively lead to a suppression of wild populations of mosquitoes. So to that end, we've conducted a number of entomological field trials to look at whether our Wolbachi infected males actually reduce uh, wild populations of, of biting females. So we've conducted a number of field trials Again, we started in Fresno here in California in 2017, and we have since expanded to conduct releases in Singapore, which is uh, still ongoing work. Uh, we're expanding and continuing releases uh, uh, through this year. We've also had releases in Innisfail in Australia back in, uh, starting in the fall of 2017. And most recently, we've been working in Ponce, Puerto Rico, where we're partnering with the US CDC uh, Mosquito Mate and the Puerto Rico Vector Control Unit to do a entomological field trial there as well. I'll start by giving you an overview of our results from Debug Fresno, which again was our first field trial. Uh, we started in um, 2017 and continued throughout the field season uh, in 2018. On the left is a map of our treatment and control sites. We selected three treatment sites shown in orange that are labeled as T1, T2, and T3. And then we had three uh, geographically matched control sites, C1, C2, C3. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, we carefully selected these sites to have uh, controls and treatments that were matched geographically and uh, similar in the number of households and uh, similar in the mosquito populations. Uh, zooming in on this uh, control area one and treatment area one, you can see that in all of our treatment and control sites, we also had pretty extensive trapping. So in black, you can see where we placed our BG sentinel traps, which collect uh, wild females. And then in gray, we have ova traps. So a combination of these two types of traps gives us uh, two different types of data. The black dots that collect uh, the number of uh, females gives us an indication of how well we're suppressing the wild population. So when we compare the numbers of females in traps from the BG sentinel traps in our control areas to our treatment areas, uh, the hope is that if our treatment is working, we'll see much fewer uh, female mosquitoes in our treatment sites than in the controls. Some of our treatment sites uh, were close to the control area. So uh, T1 and C1 were uh, close together, so we also had this buffer zone in between them where we trapped but uh, did not release the mosquitoes. Uh, the one thing to note about our treatment site too is we did have um, a substantial risk and concern that we would have uh, migration from mosquitoes outside the uh, treatment zone immigrating in, so we also had a buffer treatment there that uh, was excluded from analysis, but still had uh, releases take place. As I mentioned earlier, this was the first time that we used our automated larval rearing system uh, to conduct a field trial. So 
the first success of Debug Fresno was that we were able to use uh, this automated system in combination with our sex sorting machines and uh, new release fans to successfully deliver uh, male mosquitoes into the field. This graph on the bottom here shows you the numbers of mosquitoes that we were releasing every day of the field trial in 2018. The y-axis is the number of male mosquitoes that we released times 1,000. And then shown in the different color uh, colors is a stacked uh, subplot of the numbers of mosquitoes that went into each of the three treatment sites. The numbers vary between the treatment sites depending on how many households there were uh, and what the local mosquito population looked like in each of those sites. Uh, so as you can see, we had consistent uh, production of mosquitoes. We were releasing uh, close to 550,000 per week in Fresno, covering about 3,000 different households. And these uh, gaps you can see uh, it, on Memorial Day, 4th of July, um, and Labor Day are the US holidays. Uh, so we give the mosquitoes a day off. Uh, the second thing we were looking at in Fresno was to see how effectively our uh, released Wolbachia mosquitoes were at suppressing the wild population of, um, of Aedes aegypti. So Fresno is a desert-like um, area in California, and it has strong seasonality in the mosquito population. So this is a, a graph of what the mosquito population looks like across a season in our control sites. So uh, pretty typical of places with strong seasonality in the mosquito population. You can see in early spring, there's not many mosquitoes around. And as the temperature uh, increases and the climate uh, becomes more favorable for mosquitoes to develop, you see a rapid rise in uh, the mosquito population size. By mid to late summer and early fall, you uh, have a really strong peak in the mosquito population numbers. Uh, so lots and lots of mosquitoes getting caught in our traps. And then as it cools down again and we go into fall and winter, the population uh, drops again and uh, we see very few females in those traps. We started releases in early April, shown in this first dashed line, and then we ended releases in, in uh, mid-October on the second dashed line. What we were expecting if our suppression approach was working was that in our treatment sites relative to controls, we wouldn't see this strong peak of increase in mosquito numbers. So ideally in our treatment sites, we would see a flat line and a zero or very few female mosquitoes getting caught in those BG traps. And what we saw was uh, really encouraging. We saw an average of over 95% suppression between our treatment sites and controls. So again, uh, the, this red line is our treatment areas uh, averaged across those three treatment sites. And what you can see is uh, during that peak when we see tons and tons of mosquitoes in our treatment sites, the, or in the control sites, our treatment sites uh, barely blip above zero. So really strong suppression. Um, the biggest effect we saw was in the most isolated treatment site and we saw upwards of 97% suppression in that site. Uh, but an average of 95 uh, was, was really encouraging. So since uh, Debug Fresno, we've expanded um, into other treatment sites, but uh, I'll go through those in just a couple of slides here. And if you'd like to read more about our Fresno-based field trial, we published these results last year in Nature Biotechnology, and you can read about uh, some of the automated tools in more details and the results from Debug Fresno. So as I mentioned, we now release in Singapore. Singapore is a very different environment than Fresno. It's a tropical environment. There's much less seasonality in the mosquito population throughout the year. And we are dealing with uh, lots of high rise buildings, mosquito habitat that's dispersed across the vertical landscape as well as uh, the uh, geographic uh, ground level landscape. We started releases in the fall of 2018 in an area called Tampinas, which is in Eastern Singapore. Our first release site was this uh, small area outlined in yellow uh, that we called TP01. And we've since been expanding uh, to bigger sectors um, throughout Tampinas. So one uh, key difference uh, with Singapore is 
is that the climate is really different, as I mentioned, from Fresno. Um, and also, we uh, partner with the National Environment Agency to rear the mosquitoes locally in Singapore um, instead of using our San Francisco factory. But just like Fresno, we saw really encouraging results so far in Singapore. So these uh, result, these uh, releases are still ongoing, but uh, in partnership with the National Environment Agency there, or NEA, uh, we've uh, collected data from the Gravitraps, which also collect um, adult females, and seen that over time in areas that we've released Wolbachia-infected male mosquitoes, we see suppression of the wild population of biting females. So compared to sites without releases, uh, this graph is sort of a cartoon version of the data that NEA released on their Facebook page. Um, and in orange, this orange line shows that sites without uh, releases, so our kind of control areas where we're not treating with Wolbachia infected mosquitoes, we see uh, larger numbers of uh, potentially infectious uh, mosquitoes um, in those areas. In areas where we have consistently done Wolbachia releases, we see much fewer mosquitoes. And unlike Fresno, um, Singapore also has widespread dengue. So really encouraging uh, for us was that um, NEA has also seen really substantial decreases in dengue cases in the areas that we've released mosquitoes. Uh, they estimated between a 65% and 80% uh, reduction in dengue cases in our Wolbachia treated areas. So, um, really exciting in terms of uh, not only do we suppress the local population of mosquitoes, but that also translates into reduction in uh, diseases like dengue. As I uh, mentioned, we started uh, early in 2018 with a small release site, which is outlined in this uh, black cartoon in 2018. And we've since been expanding to other areas in the region of Tampines. And every place that we've uh, started expanding into we've seen corresponding uh, decreases in dengue cases. So we'll continue this work uh, throughout this year and hope to see uh, this pattern of reduced mosquito populations and also reduced risk of dengue. Uh, finally, our most recent field trial that we've started is Project COPA that we've done in partnership with Mosquito Mate, uh, Puerto Rico Vector Control Unit and the CDC. Uh, this trial takes place in Ponce, Puerto Rico, which is the uh, one of the uh, bigger cities in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is uh, has the highest transmission of mosquito-borne diseases uh, anywhere in the U.S. So it's a great place to conduct a Wabakia-based um, suppression approach to not only monitor um, entomological impact on releasing Wolbachia-infected um, males, but here with uh, the CDC, we're also conducting an epidemiological trial. Uh, so this trial just started in late, uh, in mid-2020, but um, over the next, uh, um, over the next year, we'll see, uh, we'll see both hopefully a, a suppression in the local population of mosquitoes, and we're also looking for um, epidemiological impact in reducing the incidence of disease. Uh, one thing that's really unique about our Puerto Rico trial that is unlike either our uh, Singapore trial or our Fresno trial is that we don't have a mosquito factory locally in Puerto Rico. In Singapore, I mentioned uh, we rear mosquitoes in partnership with NEA at their mosquito factory um, in Singapore. In Fresno, we reared our mosquitoes in South San Francisco and could easily drive the mosquitoes to our release sites. In Ponce, we actually pack and ship mosquitoes all the way from our San Francisco facility, uh, ship them to Ponce where they get delivered and released. So it's a distance of about 3,600 miles and uh, we hope that those males arrive um, happy and healthy and can go out and uh, do their job in suppressing the wild population of mosquitoes there. Uh, we don't yet have data on um, our suppression numbers or the epidemiological impact. Uh, we're blinded from the epidemiological results until the trial is over. Uh, but we do have some promising data that our packing and shipping methods, which we newly developed just uh, for this field, field trial, um, are working hopefully as intended. So again, uh, 
male longevity is a good indicator of the quality of our males um, and should hopefully correlate with their ability to be competitive in the field. So we've looked at both um, survival of mosquitoes that we've reared in San Francisco and held back and kept in our facility here, as well as mosquitoes that we've packed and shipped, uh, go through this process, arrive 3,600 miles away, uh, get unpacked and released uh, into Ponce. Uh, so we've done um, these uh, sample size numbers are sizes of, or the number of uh, packages we've either shipped or not shipped not the number of mosquitoes. We've uh, shipped hundreds of thousands of mosquitoes for these longevity assays. And what we've seen really encouragingly is that the average lifespan for mosquitoes that have been held back or uh, packed and shipped is actually identical. So we're, we're still getting over five days of adult male longevity um, after shipping. Uh, whether they've been held back as controls or shipped to Puerto Rico. So we hope that this data indicates that our males are um, healthy and happy and doing uh, a good job of outcompeting the wild males in, in Puerto Rico. Stay tuned for more, more data uh, from this trial. We'll hopefully uh, soon have data on suppression and on epidemiological impact. Uh, with that, I'd like to just thank everyone uh, that's uh, worked on this project with me at Debug and say that if you're interested in getting involved in working at a mosquito production facility we're hiring, you can uh, check out Verily's website at verily.com slash roles. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Stephen, Dr. Dobson for uh, co-presenting with me, um, David and Hector for organizing this series, and I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Great. Great. Thanks a lot, Joe. And thanks a lot, Stephen. Uh, we do have some questions and I, I think I'll just going to jump right in uh, and, and start them. Uh, Stephen, I think this is pretty, this first one is really pretty much for you. Uh, and the, the question is this, if 50% of all wild caught insects uh, are infected with Wolbachia, what are the chances that 100% of all the wild female mosquitoes of the target population will not be infected with the relevant um, Wolbachia strain prior to your inter intervention. Uh, and I guess the, it goes on here. Uh, let me just continue on here. The, there's a comment. It would seem that even if a, a tiny minority of wild females were infected, um, uh, a Wolbachia suppression method would, would grant those minority infected females a uh, selective advantage and would it eventually, you know, thwart the suppression so let me let me let me let you respond to that. And there's a there's a second part of this question, which I'll get to after you respond to the first part. So go ahead. Yeah, and you can hear me. Yep, can hear you. Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and I'll start with an apology because I may have uh, muddled, uh, confused the issue. It mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> when when I talk about fifty percent of uh, insects being infected, uh, what I'm referring to it, it's not so much that, you know, half of one species is infected. It's just that like Aedes aegypti does not have Wolbachia. Um, we, there's been some spotted reports of, of but we looked very hard and been unable to find an, a naturally infected Aedes aegypti individual. Uh, so that's, that's one, one clarification. Whereas Albopictus, they're pretty much, I mean, we can't find an uninfected uh, Albopictus. The second part is a really, really important point. Um, and I'm often asked, um, you know, like when, when Dave, when he was introducing, he talked about the, <clears throat> the study done by Hans Lavin back in the 60s. I'm often asked, well, you know, that was a terrific success. Why did it stop there? Why didn't they continue it at that point? And the reason uh, is that uh, they, they were limited to working with natural infection types. Lavin was able to find a German Culex mosquito that was incompatible with the one that was in Burma at the time. And so that's why it worked. Um, the real breakthrough that happened that allowed projects like what we're doing in Puerto Rico and Singapore and Clovis, California, is the ability to artificially move Wolbachia around. And there are literally thousands and thousands of different strains. And in this case, we moved Wolbachia from Culex pipiens, which is a uh, mosquito, the common house mosquito, into uh, Albopictus. And so, the Aedes albopictus mosquito. So uh, that's kind of a long answer, but hopefully gets at some of the uh, important points that you raised. Yep. 
Yeah. So I guess the the, the point, uh, the first point was that when you say 50 percent, you're really talking about 50 percent at the species level uh, being infected, not at the individual uh, at the individual level. Correct. Um, yeah. Great. OK, good. I think that and I think you addressed the second part of the question, which was really, you know, um, you know, how many how many different incompatibility types are there? And, and uh, what you're saying is that there is there's thousands of uh, incompatibility types. Okay, great. Um, Joe, I've got, to, there's a number of questions that were, that come from uh, people's fascination with your technology. Um, and this question starts out by saying, uh, with a comment, amazing larval rearing, uh, how do you add food to the plastic bags? Uh, are they open? So they, they look like they were sealed bags. And um, uh, so maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, I can quickly comment on that. So uh, yeah, the bags are sealed on the edges, but they have uh, small holes in the top so that we can drop uh, small amounts of food in um, and that's done by the robot. Yeah, I guess that would apply to uh, to oxygen as well, right? I mean, you'd have to keep these things aerated yeah, exactly. to a certain extent. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. so the small holes that um, work as feeding holes also allow some air exchange. Uh, they're mostly covered by plastic, but there are a couple small holes to let food and air pass in. When that robot was picking up those bags, were those holes present at the time or would they put in later? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the, the yeah, holes okay. are pretty small uh, yeah. and allow that, like, make sure that mosquitoes don't fall out and water doesn't slash out, but uh, that food and air can go in. Yeah. Good. So um, here's a question about, about cost. What would it cost uh, for the, uh, of the automatic production of a million males? So there's, you know, I guess, you know, the general, the general gist of this question has to do with cost of production. Yeah, so uh, cost of production obviously uh, will come down as we improve uh, the efficiency of this technology and spread to more places. Uh, we don't disclose our cost right now, but um, with enough scaling of this tool, I think we can be competitive with other types of mosquito control technologies. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to keep going here because with you, Joe, because there's a number of these uh, technological questions. Um, uh, this next one has to do with: um, Do the adult males live long enough inside your factory to allow them to adapt to the factory's environment compared to the wild? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think this question was also brought up in a previous webinar series where there's always lab yeah. adaptation. Whenever mm -hmm. you take wild mosquitoes and bring them into the lab, um, evolution goes on and you can't prevent some degree of adaptation to the lab environment. So we have colonies that we maintain here. Some adaptation happens uh, and we do our best to um, run assays to make sure that they stay competitive with wild males despite those uh, changes that happen from adaptation. Yeah, uh, just uh, to follow on with that, do do is there a, uh, uh, is there an effort to reintroduce uh, genetic diversity or wild type genotypes into your standing lab populations over over time? Yeah, so we definitely uh, backcross our colonies to wild mosquitoes uh, to make sure that we uh, do have uh, mosquitoes that are closely matched with our release sites. So we have um, our lines of mosquitoes that are genetically as close as possible to places where we release, um, and we yeah we start with wild um, wild mosquitoes that we then um, backcross to uh, increase the genetic diversity. Yeah. Another question from uh, one of our, uh, somebody in the audience was, uh, how many males per minute can your real-time sorter separate? Yeah, and what's, the is, what's, the yeah. what's the temperature in the tunnel? And how do you get them? I'll just add this part. How do you get them to walk uh, down that tunnel? Yeah, lots of questions, all really good questions. <laughs> I don't think we've ever calculated what the rate is per hour. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, and the rate varies. So I think when you watch mosquitoes develop, I'm sure lots of people listening have uh, spent way too much time looking at mosquitoes and watch them throughout the different phases of their development. And uh, like all phases of development, you know, there's a, there's a ramp up, a peak, and then a decline. So that goes for, you know, the pupation trend, you'll have, you know, the early pupators and the late pupators, and it looks like a bell curve in the uh, pupation timing. And the same is true for the closing. So uh, there's not really a good way to speed up mosquitoes other than 
uh, temperature manipulation to get them out of the pupil stage and into the adult stage. So we kind of work with their uh, natural occlusion curves. And when they're ready to close, they walk down the lanes, uh, get their picture taken and uh, go into our uh, containers for release. I, I kind of wish most of the time that we could um, make that more synchronous and get mosquitoes to go through the lanes faster, but it is a bit dependent on uh, just what their occlusion curves look like naturally. Yep. There's um, lots of parts of that question. So if I missed, uh, missed one of the questions there, let me know. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a, there's, it's, uh, you, you really gotta, uh, you really have to know your bug here, don't you? So, um, do, do you think here's another question from uh, from the audience so do you, uh, first of all the, they thank you for your great presentations and do you think uh, or have you simulated that in a species that do not present sexual dimorph that do not present sexual dimorphism you could achieve higher percentage of sex sorting just relying on photographing adults hmm. I would think it would be really difficult to be, uh, yeah. sex separate any kind of organism that shows no sexual dimorphism. Uh, there has to be something that the vision software can detect to classify it as, as male or female. Uh, so luckily the species we work with is Aedes aegypti. And as I showed you in the pictures, they have really, really clear differences between males and females. Um, I'm not, I can't actually think of an example of an insect that doesn't have some type of sexual dimorphism. So I think it would work for most species. Um, I think you'd be a little out of luck if you can't have a distinguishing characteristic between your males and females to separate them. Yeah. Okay. Here, here, here's, here's a, a broader question. What, what are some of the, both to both of you, actually, uh, Stephen and uh, Joe, uh, what are some best practices that you've seen for designing the sterile insect release type uh, studies to test the effectiveness of releasing males in suppressing field populations? I guess that that could that could span, you know, a lot of things in terms of best practices, but anything that you could you could add would be great. I'll let you start out, Stephen. All right, sure. Uh, well, I mean, uh, the key thing that I would emphasize that was really a, a learning curve for me is to just go into this understanding that, that this is not a Petri plate. This is not a lab type situation events are going to happen that throw your best design out the window and you have to adapt. Uh, so so that's, that's been a, a recurring theme throughout a lot of our, our studies. Uh, the second thing is just the importance of community engagement. Um, you know, this is unusual. We're going into people's backyards and properties and, and releasing mosquitoes. And, you know, initially people's eyes get very large when you start talking about that until you explain that they're male mosquitoes and they don't bite. Um, but then the last thing would be just the importance of these abatement districts. I mean, they have spent years developing trust in their communities and the ability to partner with these, these groups is really what's made this possible. Mm -hmm. Let me, before, Joe, before you jump in there, I just wanted to, to, to uh, ask you a little bit more about that, that uh, public acceptance that you've seen, uh, uh, particularly in your, in your Florida uh, work, because there, there's other new technologies, genetic control technologies being planned for field trials down in, in that neck of uh, the United States that, that aren't getting such warm receptions in some cases. And I was wondering, you know, what kind of reception have, have you gotten and you know, what do you attribute perhaps the difference uh, to in the receptions that, that your technology has gotten? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Oh, okay, I wasn't sure who you were asking. Um, yeah, that was your, 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 from your experiences down in Miami and the Keys yeah, yeah. and comparing that to some of the other things going on down there with, with regard to genetic control. Well, I, I can't really, you know, contrast and compare so much. I mean, I'm more familiar with, uh, say, what uh, Luciano was talking about a couple of weeks ago, the Wolbachia studies where they're releasing female mosquitoes. Obviously, that's a bit more difficult sell to release uh, mosquitoes that are that actually have the potential to bite people. Um, but I can say with our, with our work in uh, the Florida Keys, again, we relied absolutely on the abatement districts. They organized uh, radio announcements. Um, we had meetings where the community was invited to come in and ask questions. Um, for better or worse, what we experienced was just uh, not a whole lot of interest. Uh, we would hold these meetings and uh, some reporters would show up and not too many 
you know, interested community members. So, um, uh, you know, on one hand, it'd be great to have people to interact with, but on the other hand, if, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's nice to not be concerning folks too much. Yeah. So you found that they're, uh, they're fairly ac accepting of, of this technology? That's, that's been our experience. And, yeah. and I really think that, that uh, you know, th this is important for the, the field on a larger sense, because there's a couple of weird things that are happening uh, with these technologies. One is you're releasing mosquitoes. That's weird. But the second is the type of mosquito that you're releasing. And some people may object to one versus the other. But at least what, what I think that what Joe and what we are doing and the others that cost us and Dr. Boyer that you've heard from that, uh, you know, we're, we are addressing one of those two points. We're releasing mosquitoes and hopefully that will become more mainstream and, and part of the norm. Yeah. Okay. Joe, I'm going to move on to some, uh, actually there was a clarification of the question about the sexual dimorphism and it really had to do with, um, uh, uh, if there was sexual dimorphism at the at the pupil stage, would you be able to uh, separate them at that stage rather than adults? Yeah, so there is sexual dimorphism at the pupil stage. Yep. If you look at them under the scope, you can see mm -hmm. uh, the sexual differences um, in the um, at the base of the pupa tail. Uh, it's just really difficult to um, manipulate pupa there in water to to do it in a high throughput way. I think would be a little bit more. Uh, difficult, even though you can see sexually different characteristics in the pupil stage. So we focused on adults just because we thought it was a little bit easier. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Stephen, I'm going to go back to you about this because this question uh, sort of relates uh, to what we were just talking about. Uh, how, how long do you think, and this question states this, how long do you think uh, releases can occur before you may need to go back to the lab to find a new incompatible strain? And uh, the, the questioner was, was, says that uh, they were just thinking of, along the lines of there's a potential that a female could be released and then pass on the incompatible Bovacchia strain, and that could spread to the wild population over time. And you've talked about that. Um, but they mentioned that they get, this, they get a lot of these types of questions from the public when talking about these potential use of this technology. Right. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these, these are great questions. Um, the, the thing that gives me the, the most um, encouragement is uh, what Luciana was talking about a couple of weeks ago, where uh, like with the World Mosquito Program, they are intentionally trying to establish Wolbachia infections in the field. Uh, so in our case, we're trying to avoid it. You heard from uh, Joanna that they, we're, they're at one in 800 million, was that what it was? It's a, it's a very small uh, release yeah. rate, as opposed to the World Mosquito Program uh, is trying, you know, they're intentionally releasing lots of females and still in some cases, um, it's quite difficult to establish the Wolbachia. So, so, uh, so I think that, that those two things when, when added together, uh, reduce, uh, at least mitigate the risk of, uh, of accidental establishment. Uh, and then the second thing that I would say is, uh, with all with any of these approaches, you know, uh, evolution uh, has to be in the forefront of our mind. And will they uh, potentially, um, you know, could, could something evolve that that breaks the system down? Uh, but in the case where you've eliminated the population, there is no longer room for evolution in those cases. So I'll stop yep. with that. Yep. Great. Well, uh, we are just running out of time now, and. Uh, I want to thank uh, Stephen and Joe for really interesting presentation and stimulating and uh, and really inspirational, really in terms of um, looking for solutions to some of these major technological problems that you're facing in order to make this, you know, fairly. I'll say straightforward, although we know it's not straightforward. Straightforward cytoplasmic incompatibility phenomena, a very useful tool for controlling mosquitoes. So anyway, thanks, thanks again for uh, your great presentations and and thanks for participating in the webinar series. Before we sign off today, I wanted to let the audience know that uh, we won't have a, a webinar next week on March third. 
Uh, but we are starting, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, a new series starting uh, beginning on March 10th. And this series will be a series of four webinar, four, four weeks where we cover ecological modeling in risk assessment of gene drive uh, technologies. And the first presentation on March 10th will be the use of models in environmental risk assessment for gene drive insects given by John Mumford and uh, at Imperial College and Michael Bonsall from Oxford University. So with that, let me uh, thank the uh, speakers again, and let me thank uh, Hector for uh, my co-host, and thank Tara and Mira on the FNAH events staff for uh, supporting this series and with their technical help. Much appreciated. And thank you for the audience for attending, and we hope to see you back on March 10th. Thank you all very much, and have a nice day. Thanks, all.